Holy Father, we are once again gathered in your name. Holy Spirit, you are here in our midst. We are ready for your word. Your word is seizing. Your first simple word. Your word which will never fail. We ask that you open our heart. Grant us understanding. We receive grace to be doers of your word. That we shall be fruitful in every good work. And we will give you all the glory now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Will you please take your seat? Clap your hands and give the Lord Jesus praise. Give him a shout of praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you please come with me to the book of 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are reading from verse 13. These are some of the old messages we have heard time and time again. But the word of God is unchanging. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper, and is able to divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And is a discerner of the intent and the thoughts of men. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. For whether we be besides ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for you. Or it is for your cause. He said, for the love of Christ, glory to God. He said, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Glory to God. He said, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He died for all, that those who now live must no longer live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Glory to Jesus. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but they should live for the one who died for them and rose for them. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. In other words, he says, the life you see me living, I'm not living for myself. The life you see me living, I am living for someone, and I'm living for something that is greater than myself. He said, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I. But Christ lives through me. In other words, Christ has died for me. And he has risen for me. Now if he died for me, then those who live in the flesh should no longer live for themselves. But they should live for the one who died for them and rose again. Now in Romans chapter 14, we read from verse 7 to 8. The Bible says, no man lives for himself. And that is the part I like so much. I want you to understand that no one lives for himself. This morning, I'm sharing with you what I've entitled, Living for God. Living for God. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Romans chapter 14. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 7. Romans chapter 14, verse 7. He said, For none of us liveth to himself. No man dieth unto himself. 
none of us liveth for himself. He said, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Whether we live or we die, therefore, we are the Lord's. He said, no one lives for himself. No one lives for himself. Last week we saw from the word of God that in the last days, men shall be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, here we are talking about the apostle Paul. He said, none lives for himself. I want you to know that nobody lives for himself. Everyone is living for something and everyone is living for someone. There are people who are living for their parents. Maybe their parents told them they have to become a certain person or they have to do a certain job or they have to pursue a certain profession. And so all their lives, the life they are living, they are living for their parents. There are people who are living their lives to fulfill their parents' dreams. There are some fathers, there were things they had wanted to accomplish in life, but they were unable to accomplish it. So when they give birth to their children, all the vision all the dreams, all the pursuits. There are some parents, they had wanted to become doctors. And all that they wanted to do or they want to do is to become a medical doctor. There are some parents, they want to become lawyers. And all that they intend and they have always dreamt of and has been the ambition in life is to, have, to become lawyers or to become doctors. There are some parents, they want to become engineers. And so all that they have dreamt about and thought of and had got an, a, an ambition for is to become engineers, lawyers, or doctors. So when they have their children, before the children are born, the parents have already decided what the children are going to become. Because that which they were unable to achieve, that which they were unable to accomplish, they put everything together and they try to live it through their children. And so when the child is growing up, they are very particular about which school the child will go to. They are very particular about the course the child will study in secondary school and also in the university. And every time they say to the child, one day you become a lawyer, one day you become a doctor, one day you become an engineer, one day you become a professor, one day you become this. And let me tell you, in most of this, these desires and ambitions of the parents, very few of them want their children to become pastors. Very few of them want their children to become missionaries. Very few of them want their children to become ministers of the gospel. Most of the parents, all we want our children to be is that they must be either lawyers, they must be doctors, they must be bankers, they must work in the bank, they must work at the oil and gas, they must work at, at the hospital, they must be lawyers, they must be, you know, all the professions that we celebrate. And for some parents, there were some things they had wanted to do. And because they were unable to accomplish, they lived their dreams through their children. So every time they'll tell the child, you become a lawyer. Now, there are some parents too, they try to live their lives through their children because of some of their disappointment. Even when it comes to marriage, there are some parents, they want their children to marry from a certain tribe. They want their children to marry from a certain family. They want their children to marry from a certain profession. So they tell their children right from the time their children are young that when you grow, you have to marry from this place, you have to marry from that place, you have to do this and you have to do that. So for such a child, and they will keep rehearsing it to the child, one day you'll be a lawyer. One day you will do this. You, have, you, have to, you must marry a rich person. Also, you must marry a lawyer. Also, you must marry a doctor. Also, you must do this. So the child who is growing up and living his life is actually living the life for his parents. So the Apostle Paul said, none of us lives for ourselves. None of us live for himself. He said, listen carefully. Whether we live or we die, we belong to God. We are the Lord's property. So we live for God. So there are people who are living. There are some men, as soon as they marry, they stop living for themselves, living for God, living for anything. They start living for their wives. All the things they do, they live for their wives to please their wives. What the wife wants is what they do. Where the wife wants them to go is where they go. You know, the people the wife will want them to. In fact, women are very powerful. If you're a young man and you're not married, you may think that, oh, you know, women are not powerful. Women are very powerful. I remember a story which was once shared. They said that, okay, they had a conference and then a conference was attended by couples. And the speaker said, women are very powerful. And he said, let me tell you something. Let's see how many of you who are here who think that women are not powerful. And then there was one man who raised up the hand. 
And then when he, he raised up their hand, he said, they asked her, are you sure women are not powerful? He said, eh, I've raised up my hands. That means women are not powerful. They said, okay, how, what happened? He said, my wife told me to raise my hands. Women are very powerful. So there are some men, they are living their lives to please their wives. They are living their wives, their, their wives' dream. The kind of house their wife wants is what they build. The place they stay, whether they stay in Ghana or America or UK, wherever, is their wife's vision. The kind of people they relate with. If you're a married man and your wife doesn't want you to relate with some people, I will tell you, it will be difficult for you to relate to those people. Recently, I was in a certain conference and a certain uh, leader came to speak to us, global leader. And then when he spoke to us, he was talking to pastors and he said, how many of you pastors have people leaving your church? And some pastors raised their hands. Then he said, how many of you love it when people leave your church? And a lot of pastors were all quiet and apparently it's a kind of trouble a lot of pastors go through when people leave their churches. And then the speaker said, he said, most of the time, when people leave the church, they live with their heart before they actually live physically. Then he said something very interesting. He said most of the time, the living of the churches or the actions, they are initiated by the wives. He said when the husband goes home, the husband will ask the woman, are we in or we are out? If the woman says we are in, they will stay. If the woman says we are out, they go. And so that tells you that there are some men, no matter how strong you are, no matter how anointed you are, no matter how wise you are, let me tell you something. There are moments of vulnerabilities. There are moments when you are not in charge. If you're a young man, you think, I am in charge. If you're a young man, you think, I know what to do. I can do this. There are some of you, you want to marry women and say, I will control the woman. I will do this. I will do that. Let me tell you something. You can only have some level of control in a good sense when the woman is godly, when the woman loves the Lord, when the woman fears the Lord. But if you are thinking in your ignorance that women are weak and you manage, you do this, then you are being deceived. Women are very powerful. So he said, none of us lives for himself. So there are people, there are men who are actually living for their wives. What the wife likes is what is done. The dress, the car, the house, wherever they travel. The people the wife likes, they are the people they flow with. If your wife doesn't, don't talk to this one. The man will not talk to this one. There are men who have been raised up by their families. As soon as a woman comes into their lives, the woman is able to destroy all the relationship. The woman can tell the man, you won't go here, you won't go there, you won't do this. And the men will change. So none of us live for themselves. Everyone is living for someone. But the Apostle Paul said, the right person we must live for. And in the same way, there are some women, you know, there are some women, they, they are living for their husbands. And when a woman is living for their husband, it is scriptural. It is very scriptural, especially when the husband is following the ways of God. But most importantly, everybody is living for someone. You know, and the Bible makes us to understand that as children of God, who died for you? Your husband did not die for you. Your wife did not die for you. Your parents did not die for you. Who died for you? Christ died for you. If Christ died for you, who are you supposed to live your life for? You are supposed to live your life for Christ and live your life for God. Your goal in life as a child of God is to live your life to please God. Your goal in life as a child of God is to live for God. You don't even live for your pastor. If your pastor wants you to do something and you know it is the will of God, then you give yourself to it and you do it according to the word of God. But everybody is living for someone. But the one you must live your life for, the one you must live your life to please, is to live your life to please God. Because who died for you? Christ died for you. He died for you so that those who live will no longer live for themselves but they will live for the one who died for them. So every child of God, listen, you must make it your goal to live for God. You must make it your goal to live a life that is pleasing unto God. You must make it your goal that no matter what you are doing, no matter where you find yourself, as a child of God, you must ask yourself, am I living for God? Am I living for myself? Am I living for someone else? Or I am living for God. There are people who live for money. In Matthew chapter 6, there are people, their whole life's goal and vision is to live for money. Everybody lives for something. There is nobody who is not living for anything. Everybody is living for something. Everybody is living for someone. You are, everybody belongs to someone. You are God's property or you are Satan's property. 
You live for God or you live for yourself or you live for the devil. There is nothing like I am neutral. Everybody is living for someone. There are people too who have made up their minds that they are going to live for money. All their lives goes is to have money. They want to be one of the billionaires in their country. They want to be one of the billionaires from their city. They want to be one of the billionaires. Let me tell you something. There is nothing wrong if you want God to prosper you because you have good motives. But what I'm telling you is that when you live for God and your heart is great and your heart is towards God and his work, God is not worried to bless you. Because God knows that where your heart is, there will your treasure be. God knows that when he prospers you, you, you where your heart is, there will your finances be. So God is not against your prosperity. God is not against your success. But God is not, is not in favor of you living for something else and living for someone else other than himself. He says, I am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children to the third and the fourth generation. But I show mercy unto the thousands of them that love me. Let me tell you something. God is a jealous God. And let me tell you, and anybody who idolizes something more than God, any, anything you place importance on more than God, anything you place importance, some of you, you are living for your jobs. Some of you are living for money. Some of you are living for something else. But if you are of God and you belong to God, God is a jealous God. Anything you try to live for, anything you try to live and pursue other than God, God says, I'm a jealous God. God says, I'm a jealous God. So if God says he's a jealous God, in, in other words, sometimes what you want to do, what you want to become, there are things you go through that you may wonder. Because God says, I am a jealous God. And the jealous God says, we must live for him. We are the Lord's property and we must live for him. He said, if I live, I live for him. If I die, I die for him. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth for me. In this our generation, a lot of people are living for material things. In this our generation, a lot of people are living for money. A lot of people who marry, they are motivated by money. A lot of people, all the things people are doing, they are motivated materially by physical material things. And we are in a generation where people want to be blessed, they want to prosper overnight. We are in a generation where people want to be rich overnight. We are in a generation where people love material things more than they love human beings. We are in a generation where people love money more than they love God. We are in a generation where people don't pause to find out what the will of God is and what is driving them and what leads them is material rewards. We are in a generation where the love of God has become cold. We are in a generation where people have lost consecration. We are in a generation where people can no longer say, Lord, I belong to you. Wherever you want me to go, send me. Whatever you want me to do, tell me, I will do it. Whatever you want me to become, tell me and I will become. We are in a generation where people have become God to themselves. We are in a generation where people are living for other things other than God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, the Bible says, no man can serve two masters. In other words, there are masters in this life. Money is a master. And the Bible says God is also a master. He said no man can serve two masters. He will love one and hate the other. He will despise the other or honor the other. He said no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and you cannot serve mammon at the same level. You know, you know, there are people who say they try to use people to make money. They love money and they use people. They love money. But we are supposed to love people and use money, not to use people and love money. And so the Bible says we must live for God. You cannot live for anything else. And the Bible makes us understand that in the last days, these things are going to happen. So what kind of people are we supposed to be? What kind of messages are we supposed to preach? Especially knowing we are in the last days. We need to start preaching. We need to preach about the love of God. We need to preach about living for God. We need to preach about soul winning. We need to preach about holiness. We need to preach about serving in the house of the Lord. Because the days we find ourselves, they are the days which are evil. There is a lot of conflict and there is a lot of competition for our resources, for our heart, for our affection, for our devotion. There is a lot of competition. There is competition 
competition for our affection. There's competition for our devotion. There's competition for our love. And so instead of loving God and living for God, there are so many things in the systems of this world to compete for our affection and to compete for our dedication. But let me tell you something. The Bible says we are not ignorant of his devices. He said those who shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, there are people who are going to endure. There are people whose love will not grow cold. There are people whose zeal will not be quenched. They will be like David in this generation who said the love of God. He said the zeal of the house has consumed me. Let me tell you something. If you have lost something and you have not lost your love for God, let me tell you something. You have lost nothing. If you have lost something and you have not lost your relationship with God, my dear brother, my dear sister, you have lost nothing. The most important thing is your love for God. The most important thing is your relationship with God and living for God. If you are forsaken and you are abandoned by people you love, by people you trusted in, and let me tell you something, and God has not forsaken you, and you still love God, and you still live for God. My dear brother, my dear sister, you are rich. You are not poor. You are not miserable. But let me tell you something, if you have the whole world's goods, and you lose your touch with God, you lose your relationship with God, you lose your love for God, then it means you have lost everything. The Apostle Paul said, he said, what shall separate us from the love of God? We are in a generation where the love of God is not our motivation. People do things for with ulterior motives. They don't have the love of God. The love of God has not constrained them. The Apostle Paul said, the love of Christ constrained me. He said, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. He said, if I preach it willingly, I have a reward. He said, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. I have made a decision, a purpose. I, for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We are in a generation where, in fact, we can keep ourselves unspotted from the world. But how is it possible? It is the love of God. Most of the things that we do, if we don't love God, we can't live for God. If we don't love God, we will live for ourselves, we will live for pleasure, and we will live for others. The love of God is, is, is missing in our generation. The love of God is missing in our churches. The love of God is missing in our Christianity. But let me tell you something. What can keep you to the end is the love of God. What can keep you standing is the love of God. What can keep you continuously devoted to the things of God is the love of God. The love of man will fail. The natural human love of ma ma mankind will, will fail. What will keep us is the love of God. We are motivated by position. We are motivated by title. We are motivated by human accolades rather than what God will say about us. Thou good and faithful servant. Apostle Paul said, he said, what shall separate us from the love of God? I want you to understand that the enemy is after your love for God so that you don't live for God. No matter what you go through, the enemy wants to make sure that your love for God is destroyed. Your love for your fellow human being is destroyed. But we are not ignorant of his devices. He said, what shall separate us from the love of God? Our service in the house of God must be motivated by love. The things we do in the kingdom of God must be motivated by love. If there is no love, we cannot serve God. If there's no love, we cannot please God. If there's no love, we cannot endure. If there's no love, we cannot stand. And so the enemy will do everything possible to separate us from the love of Christ. The Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then he mentions tribulation. He mentions sufferings. In other words, all the sufferings and all the tribulations, Romans chapter 8 verse 35. Romans chapter 8 verse 35. What shall separate us from the love of God? The enemy is after your love for God. Because the love of many will wash cold. So the enemy is coming after your love. He's coming after your love. Your love for God. He's coming after your love. He said, for what shall separate us? You know, I like this translation. It says, who? Say who? Say who? He said, who shall separate us? He didn't say what. He said, who? You know, the who there means that most of the things that have been mentioned, there is a personality behind those things. So the Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Apostle Paul said, the love of Christ constrained me, restrained me. I'd wanted to give up, but the love of Christ restrained me. I'd wanted to quit, but the love of Christ kept me going. I wanted to give up, stop preaching, but the love of Christ says, you will preach. I had my own way. I didn't want to forgive. The love of Christ constrained and restrained me. He says, forgive. You wanted to revenge, but the love of Christ kept you from revenging. He says, vengeance is of the Lord. Forgive and let it go. 
So the love of Christ restrained, constrained. In other words, I am driven and controlled by the love of Christ. If you are a child of God, you must be driven, you must be controlled by the love of Christ. You must have restraint, not because you fear man, not because of what people think, but it's because of the love of Christ. Why are you restraining yourself from sinning? It's the love of Christ. Why are you restraining yourself from, from, from doing what the people of this world do? It's the love of Christ. Why are you restraining yourself from bribery? It's the love of Christ. Why are you restraining yourself from fornication? It's the love of Christ. Not the terror of sin, not the terror of consequences, but it's the love of Christ. Why are you restraining yourself from receiving an offer and accepting a shortcut which you know is not of God? The love of Christ restrained me. The devil would want you to compromise. He came to Jesus and he tempted him. He gave him an offer to make him follow a shortcut to God's glory. But Jesus did not accept it. Why? Because the love and the devotion of God restrained him. So the apostle Paul said, he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, shall tribulation. When we talk about tribulation, we are talking about troubles. In other words, behind the tribulation is a personality. Anytime the word who is used, in other words, there is a personality. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So behind the tribulation you, you go through, there is a personality behind the tribulation. And the aim of that personality is to separate you from the love of Christ. He said, shall distress, oh, uncommon trouble, difficult pains, continuous troubles, that is unbearable. In other words, who shall, shall distress? In other words, behind the distress is a personality. Who? Satan is behind. Persecution. In other words, there are times people will persecute you. There are times people will betray you. There are times people will deny you. There are times people you have trusted would actually backstab you. Who is behind? Satan, what is the aim to separate you from the love of Christ? You will even get people in the church. Christian brothers and Christian sisters can be used to hurt you, can be used to offend you. And the aim of it is to separate you from the love of Christ, which you love and you want to live for him. So behind these things, there are personalities. There are some of you, there are troubles you are going through. There are challenges you are going through in your life. There are pains you are going through in your business. There are things you are going through in your marriages. And you realize that those things are not normal. But the aim of those things is to separate you from the love of God. There are financial difficulties you are going through. Why is it so? The devil wants to separate you from the love of Christ so that you compromise. So the apostle Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The enemy is after our love for God. And in these last days, people don't love God. People don't want to live for God. And it is a very common thing. People don't want to be dedicated to God. People don't want to be committed to God because the enemy is after our love for God. Glory to Jesus. He says, shall famine, shall peril, shall the soul, all the things that we go through, it is targeted at our love for God. And that is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says that if I give my body to be burnt and I do not have love, it does not profit anything. If I sell all my goods and I feed the poor and it is not motivated by love, it does not count. In other words, love is the motivator. Love is the motivation. Let me tell you something. God would want us to serve him and live for him as a result of love. He first loved us. He has shed his love abroad in our heart. God wants us to do things for him because we love him. God wants us to serve in his house because we love him. God wants us to give the offerings and the tithes because we love him. God wants us to obey his commandment not because of the consequences of sin, but because we love him. I love God. I fear God. I will not sin against him, not because of the consequences of the sin. I will not fornicate, not because of sexually transmitted diseases, but because I love God. I will not, I will not, I will not fornicate, not because I'm afraid of premarital pregnancy, because I love God. 
We need to get to the point in our Christian lives where the things we do in the house of the Lord and in the kingdom of God is motivated and driven by love. We don't have many people in love with God in our times. That's why even in our church, we have to call people, we have to chase them, we have to say come to church, we have to say serve in ministry group, we have to say do this, do this, because there is no love for God. He said, and although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profited nothing. Why? Because God wants us to love him. God wants us to live for him. Not because we are afraid that the devil will come after us. We are not serving God because we are afraid of the devil. We are not serving God because something bad will happen to us. We are serving God because he first loved us and we love him. God wants us to serve him out of love. We are not serving God because of what we will ask him, give me, do for me, give me, do for me. We are serving God. God wants us to serve him because he has first loved us and we love him. And that's what the Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. He said, God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, love, and of sound mind. So the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. Romans 5, 5. The love of Christ has been shed abroad in our hearts. So the love is not something that is somewhere else. If you are born again as a child of God, the love of Christ has already been shed abroad in our hearts. So the love is there. The love to live for him. The love to serve him. The love to give to him. The love is already there. The love of Christ has been shed abroad in our hearts. So God wants us to love him. How many of you want to have a woman who doesn't love you? How many of you want to have a husband who doesn't love you? How many of you want to marry someone who is only interested in what you can do for him or her or what you can give to him or her rather than loving you? There are people before they even choose a wife or a husband, they put them through the love test. They try to get them to prove their love before, before they marry them. In the same way, God is a God who is compassionate. God is a God of love. God is a God who is kind. The Bible says, beloved, God is love. So because God is love, there cannot be solid relationship between God and mankind without love. The key to the relationship with God and mankind is that we must actually meet God at the point of love. That's why the Bible says, he brought me to the banquet table and his banner over me is love. You cannot walk and live a successful Christian life by faking it. You must have the love of Christ working in your life. And the love of Christ has already been shed abroad in our hearts. When you become born again, the love of Christ is automatically imparted to your spirit so that you'll be able to love God and to love your fellow human beings. God doesn't want us to obey the commandment just because we are afraid. But he wants us to love him and obey the commandment out of love. I love God, so I obey his commandment. Not because I am in terror. That's why I obey his commandment. So God wants us to walk in love. Love towards him. The love of Christ. If there is something you have to fight for, is that I will walk and love God. I don't want to lose anything in this life. I don't want to lose anything that has to do with the love of God. Lord God, keep me in your love. Keep me in your love. He said, many shall become lovers of themselves and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So God wants us. He said, all the things we do. He said, even if I prophesy, even if I prophesy and I do not have love, it does not benefit me anything. It does not profit anything. So God wants us to walk in love. And the love, first of all, walk in love towards him. The greatest commandment is love. That you shall love the Lord your God and love your fellow human being. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Glory to God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. He said, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. If there is anything, you have to love God. The reason why people backslide easily, today they are in the church, tomorrow they fall away. They don't have personal love for God. They don't know him. They don't love him. They don't love him. He said, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy might. 
And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Which is this commandment? That I shall love the Lord my God with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my resources. And this commandment must forever remain in my heart. The commandment of love. To love God. What happens when you love God? There are blessings in loving God. He said, eyes have not yet seen, neither has ears heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men. What God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, there are things God has prepared for those who love him. But the first thing is, God says, if he died for you, then those who live must no longer live for themselves, but must live for the one who died for them. And he said, the love of Christ consumes me. So what must I do? The first thing you have to do is to live for God. If you love God, you live for God. The way you can as demonstrate your love for God is that you live for him. If you love God, you live for him. If you love God, what does it mean to live for God? If you love God, you live for him. That is why the apostle Paul said, I was the chiefest among sinners. I was the persecutor of the church. I was a gent, I was a person who was zealous but in ignorance. I persecuted the church. I fought Christians. I stoned Christians to death. If God was going to save anyone, it should never have been me. If God was going to have mercy on anyone, it should never have been me. The apostle Paul said, I was the chiefest among sinners. I was a persecutor of the church. I was destroying Christians. I was burning. I was leading people to stone them. I stoned Stephen, who was a martyr. I killed him. And so if God was going to save anyone, it should not have been me. But the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, it said Christ, God commanded his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, that Christ even died for us. He said, scarcely would anybody die for a righteous man. But while we were yet sinners, he said God commended his love towards us. In that he died for us. So if he died for us, the basic thing he, he, he requires of us is that we shall love him and we shall live for him. Are you living for yourself or you are living for God? These are questions we need to answer. And there are things we do. And there are things that are consistent in our lives. When we claim we are living for God. We are not living for our pastor. We are not living for our church. We are not living for our parents. We are living for God. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. When he was crucified on the Christ, I shared in his crucifixion. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In other words, I'm a human being. I'm walking about in my physical body. He said, yet... I do not live for myself. It is Christ who lives in me. Every child of God must fight to live for God out of love. You must not live for God out of fear. You must not live for God out of societal pressures. You must not live for God because it is trendy. It's a fashion. I remember when in 1998, I was going from room to room. I went to Commonwealth Hall and I was preaching the gospel in Commonwealth Hall. And when I was preaching the gospel, a certain gentleman who happened to be my course mate, he told me something. He said, young man, I, I admire your zeal. I admire what you are doing. He said, I hope by the time we are through the university, you will still carry the fire of God. You will still carry the presence of God. You will still be on fire for God. You will still have the love of God. He said, when we were in secondary school, we remember there was SU. So at every point in time, everybody gave their lives to Christ. Anytime an altar call was made, everybody came forward and they gave their lives to Christ. But after secondary school, most of all those people have fallen away. I hope your story will never be like that. And I said, I thank God. He's faithful to keep me to the end. But most importantly, I love God and I want to live for him. That was the answer I gave him. There are people who are living for God because it has become trendy. They are trying to live for God because the only way they can find a husband or they can find a wife is to come to the church and pretend to be very busy. Pretend to like the things of God so that they can find a, a husband. So it's become fashionable. It has become trendy. They have a certain motive. If you're living for God, it's not born out of your love for God. The Bible says it will not stand. It will not stand the test of time. If everybody is doing it, so you two are doing it. It will not stand the test of time. It will not stand the test of time. Everybody must work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. It will not stand the test of time. But if your service in the house of the Lord, all the things you do in the kingdom of God is motivated and undergirded by love, it will stand the test of time. 
It will stand the challenges. It will stand difficult times. And there are people too. You see, when you are hungry in Ghana, you are broke in Ghana, you are frustrated in Ghana, you, you, are, you are struggling in Ghana, and that is why you are serving God and you are living for God. When your geography is changed and you are suddenly translocated and transported to a foreign country, to Europe, to America, and all the things you now pray, you used to pray for in Ghana, it is given to you. The government has solved that problem. What you used to pray for, the food you used to pray for, they are giving it to you. The job you used to pray for, now there are jobs. You can have night, you can have day, you can have weekend. It is available. The good housing you used to pray for, now they are chasing you. They say, buy a house. We'll give you a flexible terms of payment, and it is made available to you. All the things you've been looking for, the cars you struggle to earn, now the banks are saying you can buy a showroom car we will give you good times to pay and you are moved to some foreign country you backslide you will fall away that is why there are people who get visas they pray for god to take them to some country and when they get to that country they backslide when they were poor and they were broke and they were miserable and they were going through challenges they knew god and they were serving god but they did not allow their heart to be converted they did not allow the love of god to be established in their heart so when their location and their situation is changed they will turn their backs on god but when the love is genuine, when the love is genuine, no matter where they put you, it will not be easy, but it will stand. I said, it will not be easy, but it will stand. Last week I told you, there's a place in the UK, it is called Oxford Street. And there was a place called Soho. And one day I went to that place. I was with another Ghanaian in 2000 and then we went to a certain cubicle when i went to the cubicle if i by the street you see naked women you see people standing by the roadside and they are doing all manner of things and i went to the, the tow booth we didn't have phones like this we had to telephone booth you go to the tow, phone booth and make a call when i went there i said jesus then i ran out then a gentleman told me if this is how you behave you can't survive in this land oh there are people who cannot survive in different lands because in ghana here they have not been exposed to certain comfort, certain, certain opportunities, certain open doors. And so they, are, they seem to be spiritual. They seem to be Christians. But when they are exposed, they will quickly turn their backs onto God. Because their love is not there. Their love is not deep. Their love is superficial. Your affection for Christ is superficial. It is motivated by something external. He said, if I bend myself, if I give myself, if I bend my body, if I sell all my house goods to feed the poor, and I do not have love. It profited nothing. There are people who have come into ministry because they think when you come into ministry, you will get a big car and drive a nice car. There are people who have come into ministry because they think when you come to ministry, everybody will like you. Everybody will serve you. There are young people who feel anytime they think about the ministry, they think about being a, a, a boss and every, sending people go and come. They think about driving a new car, a big car. They think about four-wheel drive. They think about traveling abroad, going and coming. And so that is their motivation for coming into the ministry. So when they come into ministry and they begin to suffer challenges, difficult times, one of the things you go through when you are working with God is what we call the wilderness period. Wilderness does not mean God is not with you. Wilderness does not mean you are not anointed. Wilderness does not mean you are not called. But this generation will not allow the Spirit of God to lead them into the wilderness. The Bible says, and the Spirit of God came upon Jesus, and he led him into the wilderness. So when you are in the wilderness, it doesn't mean that God is not leading you. He was led into the wilderness. The wilderness is a time of waiting. The wilderness is a time of testing. The wilderness is a time when there are delays in your life. The wilderness is a time when it appears as though God is not with you. Every man, every woman called by God who claims they love God, they will go through the wilderness period. Moses went through the wilderness period. He went through the wilderness for 40 days, 40 years. When he thought that everything had come to an end. His deliverance ministry, he thought had come to an end. But he was in the wilderness. God was preparing something greater and something bigger for him. But he was trained in the wilderness. Let me tell you something. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness. And when they wandered in the wilderness, those who were not supposed to go to the promised land, they were removed from their midst. 
Jesus, the son of God, went through the wilderness. David went through the wilderness. Anybody who loves God and who has been called for an assignment will go through the wilderness. But when you are living for God and it's motivated by love, when you go through the wilderness, you will not quit. When you go through the wilderness, you will not give up. We are in a generation of young men and women who are not patient. They want things overnight. They want things instant. We are in the microwave generation. A generation of comparison. A generation is, if God did for this person at this time, why has my own not happened? If God has done for this one, why has this one happened? This one was my classmate. This one was my junior. We are in a generation of comparison. We are in a generation where we desire instant blessing, even at the expense of the love of God. So the apostle Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There are people when they are waiting on God and it's not happening, they are deceived to look for help from somewhere. Why do you look for help from somewhere? To make it look it's as if it is God who has done it for you. He says, I'm the Lord God. My glory I will share with no man. Anything that you depend on the arm of flesh, anything that you depend on another source other than God, and you pretend as if it is God who has done it in your life, you are being a hypocrite. And God says, his glory he will share with no man. Because there is no love. There is no love. If you love God, what will you do? You will live for God. How will you live for him? Romans chapter 12 verse 1. May the Lord fill you with his love. May you overflow and abound with the love of Christ. May the love of Christ move you. May the love of Christ constrain you. May the love of Christ restrain you. May you live for God. May you live for Christ. May you put earthly ambitions aside. May you deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow him. May you love the Lord God and love him to the end. May nothing come between you and the love of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may you serve out of love. May you give out of love. May nobody's action stop you from loving God as you have purpose in your heart. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Sometimes, there are certain things pastors don't want to talk about. Because when you talk about it, it's as if you are stepping on the toes of people. It's like when you talk about it, there are people who suddenly don't want to speak because they don't love God. You see, when you love God, you can be rebuked. You will love God the more. When you love God, you can be corrected. You will love God the more. When you love God, no matter what, when you love God, you will not like flatterings. When people are flattering you, they are, you, are, you are being flattered left, right, center. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Mm. Mm. Me wo peri me pia, ni di ni Jesus, oh sombo, ame, enti me po, ni di da da da, ama, ama.
Hallelujah. Listen carefully. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Holy and ourselves. Now, in, in, in this, our generation, we make it look like, in fact, when you, when you look at the internet, every sin you see, most of them does not edify. It does not edify. How do you start living for God? You start living for God by presenting your bodies unto him as a living sacrifice. In other words, there are two kinds of sacrifice. There is a dead sacrifice and there is a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they were required to give a dead sacrifice. But in the New Testament, we are required to give a living sacrifice. And the living sacrifice is our body. He said, listen, present your bodies. And he said, it should be holy and acceptable. Which is your reasonable service. In other words, your living for God, it starts with presenting your bodies to him as a living sacrifice. It starts with presenting your, it starts with present your body to him as a living sacrifice. In other words, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost dwelleth in you. And so you are presenting your bodies unto God as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. What is holiness? Holiness means you are called from the world unto God. You are turned from the world unto God. You are turned from unrighteousness. You are turned from sin unto living holiness. Holiness means separation. The word holiness is from the Greek word which means hagio. Hagio means separation. Separation from the world and separation unto God. I am separated unto God. I am separated from the world. The pleasures of the world, they don't have influence on me. I don't live for the pleasures of this world. I don't live for the systems of this world. I live for a system and I live for one person. I live for God. And living for God starts with my body. Holy and acceptable unto him. My body belongs to God. Anything that would defile my body will defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. My body is not mine. We've already established the fact that you are not yours. You belong to God and you are living for God. It starts with presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. So, in other words, if you're a young man, if you're a young woman, whoever you are, any form of sexual immorality, it is unholiness. That means your, your sacrifice is not holy. Strange sacrifice. It means that your sacrifice is not holy. It means you are not living for God. Glory to Jesus. Praise God. Why are you quiet? Hallelujah. So, it means that sexual immorality in the church, sexual immorality among Christians. I, I know you have struggles. God will have mercy and help you. But I'm saying that your living for God starts with your body. So all the things we do, pornography, we are polluting the temple. Masturbation, we are polluting the temple. Fornication, sleeping with someone who is not your husband or is not your wife, we are polluting the temple. All manner of practices, lesbianism, sodomy, we are polluting the temple. Uh, now we have what we call video sex, where people expose their, their bodies and somebody watches it on video who they are not married to. It, it's not a holy sacrifice. It's not a presentable sacrifice. You are not living for God. That is why if you're a young man or you're a young woman and you think you have found someone you can marry, come and let's help you to marry. If you are also cohabiting and you are struggling, come and let's make it official. Let's bless it for you so that you can sleep with your husband, sleep with your wife without any conscience pricking you. When you go to a church and the young men are struggling to fulfill their ministries and the young women are struggling to fulfill their ministry, find out and see that they are cohabiting, they are sleeping together, they are involved in sexual immorality, so it affects their zeal for God, it affects them from living effectively for God. What will affect you from living effectively for God is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality can prevent you from living effectively for God. Your sacrifice, your living sacrifice starts with presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. 
The fact that fire is not falling down to strike you doesn't mean God is pleased with you because of fornication. The fact that fire will not, the earth will not open and swallow you does not mean God is pleased with your adultery. The fact that, listen, something strange has not happened. It is just the message of God which is giving you time to repent. The message of God gives us time to repent. It does not mean God endorses and approves of our ungodly practices. Are you here with me? So, listen. We have forms, counseling forms. The reason why, if you're a young man, your, your desire should be God and nothing else. You are winning souls. You are fasting. You are praying. You are inviting people to church. When those things are not there, the enemy makes it easy by introducing sexual immorality among the people. There are two things that can destroy churches. Disunity, especially among leaders. And sexual immorality. When sexual immorality is in any group, whether it's the choir, whether it's the ushers, whether it's among ministers or workers, the enemy begins to have an entry point to come and frustrate the work of God in the church. All the things that we do, listen, you give your breast to someone to press it small. You, you give your lips, they, you, you smooth small. You do all those things. Eh, we didn't enter. Whether you entered or you didn't enter, it is sexual immorality. Oh, we, we just did prelims. Whether it's prelims or whatever it is, it is sexual. Listen, today you people are not shouting. You are not shouting. Listen, the, let me tell you something. The fact, that, the fact that all the things on the internet is promoting sexual, illicit sex, illicit sex, relationship dressing, the way people dress, they, they cut their dress short. You see their navel there like that. And then some of them too, they, they, they cut their, their skirt like that. All those things. And then we have the low breast type. The breast is low. What are you advertising? When you wear that your jeans, then you wear very tight jeans so that some, some lines will show. What, what are you advertising? It's not, a, it's not a holy sacrifice. You are distracting other people. It's not a holy sacrifice. You are, you are, you are bringing attention to yourself. It's not a holy sacrifice. In the last days, living holy is going to be more and more challenging. That is why we must preach and teach and put systems in place to help ourselves and our brethren to live a holy life. I'm telling you, when we were younger, what you call blue film, I don't know if you've heard blue film, we will stand behind the window and watch blue film. Or they will give us what we call a Playboy, Playboy magazine, you will see the pictures. And when we see it, we were excited. Today, you don't need to go and stand behind anybody's window. Today, you don't need to go to your friend's house to collect a Playboy magazine. Right on your phone. 247, available to you. Listen. If there is a time we need to preach and teach holiness. If there is a time we need to fast and pray. For holy living, it is now more than any other time. Listen, the fire will be heated seven times. The enemy will make things more and more unbearable. People will begin to compromise. People will begin to turn and they will begin to win the approval of their bosses. Win the approval of other people. They are going to be lured into various groups. So if we are preachers, it's about time we preach holiness like never before. It's about time we preach holy living like never before. I'm telling you, the times are going to be more and more difficult. A time will come when you commit sin, you may think it's normal. It's a normal practice. It, it, it's like it's normal. There are these times, even when you find a lady who is a virgin, their friends laugh at her. Their friends rather do what? They laugh at them. 
In other words, you have become the odd one. In other words, what is unacceptable by scriptures has become the normal. And what is acceptable by scriptures has become the odd one. So I'm telling you, it's going to be difficult. If you're a man, you must have a side chick. It becomes normal. So we are not living for God. And if you are not careful in your pastor, people who support you, when they are not behaving well, if you are not strong, you can't talk about it. Young women and men, please pick forms. If it is somebody's husband, leave him alone. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Say me share your ya, 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 story. A certain young minister who was struggling said, he went to see his mentor in the Lord and he told the mentor, the mentor, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with sexual immorality. I'm, I'm struggling with the women, the young women in the church. And the mentor said, it is normal. The mentor told him it is normal. It is a very normal thing. It's a very common thing. Every pastor struggles. Every pastor goes through that. And so it is normal. Grace of God will cover you. Instead of the pastor saying, come, let's go and fast. Let's go and pray. Let me be your accountability partner. Do you have any problem in your marriage? How is your relationship with you and your wife? Do you spend time with single women? Do you carry them in your car? Do you give them counseling alone? Let me help you. Let's pray out of this thing. This is not normal and this is not common. The senior minister told him, it is common and it is a normal thing. He said, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Continue for me. He said, Apostle, I come anytime you are preaching holiness, you don't talk about other things, but you talk about sexual immorality. Because let me tell you something. Every sin a man commits is outside his body. But whosoever shall commit sexual immorality sins against his own body. And your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That is why you can't pray effectively. That is why you can't witness effectively. That is why you can't be fruitful. That is why you can't be productive. That is why you can't live the life God wants you to live. Because you are sinning against the Holy Spirit who dwelleth in your body. You are destroying your temple. He said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You have to learn it. Next week we will continue. You have to learn how to possess your vessel. You have to learn it. God will not do it for you. You have to learn it. 
You have to know those you call your friends. You have to know the places you go and the places you don't go. You have to know what you watch on the internet. I was talking to a certain friend and he told me, I'm no longer on Android phone. I'm using Yam. I said, why are you using Yam? He said, certain women I do not know started sending me their naked pictures. So I have stopped using my phone. I am using Yam. If you have to stop using Android phone, stop it. If you have to stop using phones, now has YouTube, stop it. If you have to stop using phones, not have Facebook, stop it. If you have to stop using phones, you are not out there to impress anyone. You are out there to live for God and to please God and to possess the vessel in sanctification and in honor and to abstain from sexual immorality. That's what you are there. So whichever method you will use. When I was growing up, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. In a Pentecostal church, we never befriended girls. We never befriended women. In Pentecostal church, we never hug women. We only stretch our hands to shake people. When you come and you wanted to hug us, we only stretch forth our hands to shake. There are some of you, you are going around hugging all the women in town and and whenever you hug them, you like what you feel on your chest. So that's what you like doing. When I grew up in Pentecostal church, we, I, we were not used to hugging. In fact, the women were sitting at one side and the men were also sitting at the other side. And we were taught holiness and purity. And we were not into this right. And who, who is your close friend? My close friend, you're a woman. Your close friend is a boy. What is wrong with you? You are, you are a woman all the time. You are moving with boys, boys, boys. Your best friends are all boys. What is wrong with you? Give the devil no place. You are a young lady. Your best friends are all married men. What is wrong with you? I'm, I'm, I'm stopping. He said, Apostle, don't you want 2,000 members in your church? Why are you, why are you preaching these messages? Yes, in this time, I'll get 50,000. But I will preach what is the Bible. I will preach what is the word of God. I will not stop preaching the word. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Hey. The Bible says, if you see that your right hand can make you sin, cut it off. There are some relationships you need to cut them off. I remember somebody who was breaking up with his boyfriend. And he went to the house and said, I came to tell you something. I came to tell you where I want to break up with you. You are breaking up with your boyfriend. You've been fornicating with the boyfriend. You want to break up with the boyfriend. You went to his house. You and the boyfriend alone. And uh, I came to tell you, <laughs> I want to break up with you. That day, the heavens were turned upside down. Some of you cut off some relationships. He said, nevertheless, look at this one. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them who are his. Look at what the Bible is saying. Living for God, though. The Bible says, if you are his, you will live for him. He said, the Lord knows those who are his. It's not everybody who claim, ah, the Lord, the Lord is of the Lord. He said, listen, the Lord knows those who are his. Then he said, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What is this iniquity he's talking about? Look at it. Depart from iniquity. He said, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Continue. If a man shall therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Look at verse 22. What is he talking about? Purge yourself from what? Verse 22 gives us the answer. Look at it. Flee also youthful lust. Flee youthful lust. Flee what? Flee what? Flee what? One day I was consulting. 
and a certain man over 90 years, he came after I had seen him. He said he needed additional medications. And I said, for what? He said, um, he's not able to perform very well. 90 years. So, so if the Bible says flee youthful lust, it doesn't mean if you are 50, you should not flee. It doesn't mean if you are above 50, you should not flee. He says you should flee. Instrumentalists, they say what? You should flee. When they say flee, it means you should run away as if some terror is following you. It didn't say pray. Rako Sataya. Rema, I rebuke this breast. I rebuke this girl's body. No, 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 no. You don't rebuke a girl's body. It was made like that. You flee from it. He says, Live for him. It begins with presenting your bodies and living. No, he says, People don't have mentors. Young men and women, you don't have mentors. You don't even want to fight for holiness. You think it's not, it's not necessary. You are gifted. You are talented. It doesn't really matter. So you, you, don't, you don't have mentors. You don't have people you talk to. I'm struggling here. I'm struggling there. Help me. Pray with me. Counsel me. Be my accountability partner. Be my accountability person. Let me report to you. We don't have it in the church. But God is raising up a glorious church. He's raising up a mighty church. A glorious church. He's raising up an army. And you are one of them in Jesus' name. You are part of that army in Jesus' name. If you love God, you will stay from fornication. Joseph said, God forbid that I will sin against him and my master by... So in other words, Joseph acknowledged, loved, and feared God. I finished. This morning, I want us to pray. I want us to pray that the love of God will overflow in our heart. That we will be able to live for Him and serve Him. That we will stand and endure to the end. I want every eye closed, every head bowed. If I live, I live for you. I want every eye closed, every head bowed. Should I die, I die for you. In all my You are here this morning you want to be born again you are here this morning you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior as every eye closed and every head bowed I want to pray with you I die for you as every eye closed every head bowed I want to pray with you I want to pray with you say pastor someone invited me I don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. Pastor, I fell away. I want to be restored unto fellowship. Will you please pray with me? As every eye closed and every head bowed, I want to pray with you. As every eye closed, every head bowed, I want to pray with you. Just lift up your right hand. You want to give your heart to Jesus? You want to be born again? You want to live for him? I want to pray with you. Church, I want you to pray and ask God that he will grant you the grace to live for him, to walk in his love. Continuously, just talk to him. 